modern color atelier. I've been an artist and an educator for over 20 years. I have degrees in English literature and in painting. And so as a teacher, as the director of this program, I really see it as part of my creative practice where the kind of Venn diagram overlap of language, literature, poetry, and visual intelligence, love of painting, love of perception, overlap. And so the program that I've been developing over the past 20 years is really a grammar. It's a poetics for color. And so the people that have been part of this program with me, what we share is a language for talking about color relationships. And I know from so many artists starting out that color is the most overwhelming thing to try to grasp. We all have kind of emotive, um, intuitive feelings about color, but there are also a lot of amazing analytical things that we can learn about it and use as tools to create confidence that when we are mixing colors on our palette, we can actually make some really thoughtful, poetic uh, decisions in order to get our meaning across. And so some of the ways that I like to break down color, um, are, <laughs> I want to start with just this total scale here, or value scale, moving from light to dark. And that's one of the main ways that we can begin to talk about the colors that we're seeing how light or how dark are those colors. And so in day-to-day -day living, we recognize like uh, that the bakery has a red facade or that that umbrella is red or that the sky is blue. And so we have these names for these local colors of things, but really limited vocabulary. There are what, 10, 12 colors that we can all come up with and agree on. One of the beautiful things about learning the language of color and color mixing is all of the infinite colors that we can get that we don't have names for. And so setting up this idea of poetry in painting, poetry in the sense of creating a language for it, we can ask, okay, I see a color next to another color, I don't even know what color it is. It's not clearly red, orange, yellow, blue, green, or violet. But I can see that compared to the other colors, it's not my darkest dark, it's not my lightest light. Maybe it's kind of a middle value. Okay, that's a good starting place. Or kind of a middle dark value. And then when we begin mixing our complement sets or our cross sections of colors, we start to neutralize colors and again, get all of these wonderful varieties of colors that we don't have names that are easy to identify. And so we can say, <laughs> how light or dark is that color? And then we can say, how warm or cool is that color? And so thinking about temperature, which is a little bit more fickle, but both value and temperature are relative. So we're not talking about individual colors in isolation. We're talking about colors within a universe of relationships. And then we can say, well, how neutral or saturated is that color? And so those three ways of asking questions, what value is it? What temperature is it, warm or cool? And how <coughs> intense or saturated or neutral is that color? We can begin to touch on this, these beautiful unnameable colors and to be able to respond to them. And so in some ways, stripping out the obvious nameable colors, like the bakery is red, getting rid of that and instead going underneath and starting to think about the foundations of the relationships of color through value, temperature, and intensity, we can start to build some really interesting constellations or harmonics of color. And so all of the works that you're seeing in the gallery right now are artists who have studied with me for at least two years, some more, and I just wanna invite you all with this new just kind of little 101 of color theory, color practice, to start to notice how the different artists are using different palettes. So if we look at Sally Schintaffer's three pieces over here, we can see very clearly that she's not using as saturated a color as say Anne B here, who's hanging out a little more on the outer rug in some of these pieces. But Sally's honing in on these 
more subtle kind of inner rungs to speak about um, this really wonderful kind of human quiet sort of silent space, an abstraction of still life and figure, a uh, beautiful piece here where we have a kind of figure to form emerging. And then an artist here like Angela Fleet, uh, beautiful Tieton laundromat paintings. I was out here with a group of painters this October and Angela fell in love with the facade of the laundromat and started doing some sketches on site and then back in the studio uh, started to develop these paintings. And so taking a limited palette, especially in this one, we've got a complement set of yellow and violet and the beautiful, interesting, neutral colors that can happen in that. And so being able to see what does this universe that I'm creating look like in this slightly altered palette versus this palette here, which touches a little bit more on some of the outer rungs and we have a clear warm light moving in. We can see the warm light touching the facade here versus in the shadows, we're leaning more towards the greens and the blues. And so temperature is a really fun way of thinking about the quality of light. And so when we're thinking just about value, we're talking about the quantity of light, how much or how little. But when we start thinking about the temperature of the light, whether or not that light is warm and our shadows are cool, or we can flip it and make all of our lights cool and our shadows warm, we can really change the poetics and the meaning of the piece. And so I'm gonna point over here, but I encourage you after I'm talking to come and really look at this. This artist, <laughs> Cecilia Herrera, really interesting palette that is kind of this weird dreamy space that she's created. And one of the things I want to point out to you that's so exciting and strange about these paintings is that she's rigorously mixing each color choice to express a cold light. And all of our cast shadows here are warm, which is a little bit of a reversal of what we're usually used to. And so it's like, ah, oh, once you kind of realize that and kind of move around the painting and see that operating, <laughs> it creates a really interesting tension. Uh, so perhaps we're in Antarctica with that painting versus in Angela's, we're in maybe Southern Spain or <laughs> Titan or white. <laughs> Um, Anne Bean's work over here, Anne's right here, um, really inspiring watching your work develop over the last few years, really coming out of more traditional kind of realist still life painting. But over the past few years, really breaking down the observed still life. We can see it most uh, represented here in a way, starting to cut up her drawings, collage them back together, really alter and fracture perception to create these newfound scenarios very much out of a modernist tradition of cubism with Picasso, Brock, Juan Brie, and starting to make a more emotional space that we can kind of move into that feels a little bit more like what it's like to be alive. Uh, things are very fractured. This is another one by Anne here. Beautiful, really beautiful piece. And we can see this again is coming from an observed still life theater that she set up, but it's really analyzing the color relationships like this large swath of darker value pools set against this beautiful geometry of this warmer light coming in, casting the cool shadows within the bounds of the theater. And then we have an artist like Dave Eggleston, who's also here, where are you, Dave? These beautiful pieces that are very much riffing off of different art historical paintings and narratives. So if any of you are familiar with Manet's painting of Olympia, he's really going inside of that painting and changing things and making it his own. Similarly here, a Manet painting, the execution of Maximilian, going in and really playing with the narratives, but really with these, and of course we've got a kind of Greco Roman frieze where Dave has taken different life room studies, so painting observationally from the model, and then collaging and kind of placing all of those poses together into a kind of Greco Roman frieze here. But Dave's real interest here is in the materiality and the way that he's building these spaces as these narratives are evolving 
scraping down the pain, pain back in. Every time I would see one of these paintings, they were drastically different um, from week to week, from day to day. And so that narrative is built into the technical aspects of the piece, the building of it, the surface. And I want to point out here to Margaret Haven's work, who's not with us today, but she's really clearly having fun on the outer rung, those saturated colors, and hanging on, hanging on that outside intense colors, but really translating each shape into a very analyzed, explicit color of value, temperature, and again, mostly intense colors here, into a really beautiful kind of geometry of parts. And so I really believe that when learning to paint, what we're actually doing is we're learning to see. Because the way that we move through the world on a day-to-day -day basis, we're avoiding things, we don't want to get hurt, there's a tiger coming out of the jungle, we got a bird, there's a red berry that might be poisonous. But the language of painting is a completely different world. It is a theater of interactions. And so learning how to articulate and name differences in the visual things that we're seeing creates this whole way of navigating reality that also gives us confidence to engage with it as a picture maker, as an image maker. It gives us the confidence to name and mix specific relationships so that we can participate in the building of reality. It's a revolution. <laughs> it's painting poetics. It's visual poetics. And it has been such a joy working with all of these phenomenal artists that are constantly teaching me and showing me new ways of seeing and being in the world. So I would love if the artists that are here just to kind of raise your hands so people can see you. This is Sally Shintafa, who work here, and Bean, saturated, more abstract. <laughs> Angela Fleet has the laundromats here, the collage is there, and Dave Eggleston back here. So if you guys have questions for them, um, be wonderful. Um, you can either talk to them um, privately or if you want to ask questions to me, I would love, love to hear what your thoughts are about the show. So also thank you again so much for having me here today. It's, it's a real honor to be here. Yeah. She is. She is. Yeah. Yeah.